Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have David Richards. Hello. Catherine Myers. Hey, hey. Eric Berry. Hey. Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, and that is Victor Shepelov. Shepelov. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, everyone. Now, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself real quick, let people know who you are and all that stuff? Yeah, I'm a Ukrainian uh, programmer and poet. I am uh, programming like since since childhood, so it would be more, more or less like 20 years and programming in Ruby like 12 years, mm, doing a lot of uh, open source, doing a lot of mentoring, uh, participating in uh, discussion of uh, Ruby progress, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, not, not so. So that's me. <laughs> nice. I love I love the programmer and poet bit. That's awesome. Do you ever write poetry about Ruby? Uh, not about Ruby, but about programming conferences. Sometimes it's um, it turns to be pretty successful. You can read it to programmers, and they they say, "Oh, we, we thought that poetry is boring, but it's not." I I've love always it. wanted to write Ruby that uh, would be read in meter. <laughs> I'm just not yeah. that good at it. I just finished a, about 40 tweets. It was, if poets wrote resignation letters, and I took people's little snippets of poetry as if they were quitting their job. It was pretty oh, nice. funny. <laughs> yeah, I'm also trying to figure out what rhymes with GDPR, so. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we're, we're here to talk about functional programming. So, uh, yeah, let's let's dive into that. Now, um, when we talk about functional programming, what are we talking about with Ruby? Because Ruby, I always hear how object-oriented it is and stuff like that. And then it's, yeah, but it's got all these awesome functional stuff in it. So so how do you think about it? How, how do we approach functional programming with Ruby? Uh, well, uh, from the very be beginning, as far as I can understand uh, Matt's intentions, Ruby was not just object-oriented, it was multi-paradigm uh, language. Uh, I, uh, I, so, uh, sorry for a small interruption, I was la uh, once a computer journalist and a historian of programming languages, and uh, I'd like to say that most of uh, uh, Today's popular languages, they are like postmodern. Uh, they are not uh, strictly in some paradigm, but they mix, mix them all in uh, some, some percentage. Uh, so uh, in Ruby, uh, we always had something like... Uh, most 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 of things that uh, uh, that uh, that do a basic functional programming like uh, high high order fu functions and uh, this stuff uh, so the functional functional style of of programming was uh, possible even in uh, when i when i started to write on it in it was ruby 1 1.6 probably but at, at that time it was uh, more popular to, to think object-oriented, to see in uh, uh, large architectural uh, things about uh, 
classes and modules and um, and models and uh, and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, in res- recent years, when uh, it turns out that uh, object orientation is uh, um, some some say uh, that it's uh, overestimated. Some say that it's uh, complete. Completely a wrong, a wrong direction and dead end in uh, development of computer languages. I'm I'm not that uh, that uh, extremist, but uh, uh, it turns out that uh, the things that uh, not not that postmodern as as Ruby is uh, the classic um, not not classic the modern things pre pre postmodern from uh, languages like Haskell. Uh, they, they still have. Uh, Really good ideas, uh, which uh, uh, doesn't mean we, sh- we should all switch to Haskell uh, today. Uh, oh, sw- switch if you can. It's it's awesome. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, some some of approaches they uh, tend uh, tend to provide us with clear architecture. It's uh, all common 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 places now, so it's uh, like. To, to establish common ground that uh, bearing some some functional style in any language in whatever language you you write is is a good thing. Uh, so uh, getting getting closer to, to Ruby, uh, I believe that um, there are some some tendencies now to uh, stretch it to be like fully func- functional, like uh, with uh, monads and stick to mutability and and uh, it's awesome, like an experiment, but uh, it uh, it doesn't tend uh, tend to be things that um, uh, that are really feeling feeling natural in in the language. It, it wasn't created this way. It's uh, easier to, to to switch some to some more functional uh, language that uh, embraces Im- immutability more strictly. But uh, a lot of uh, I'd say small tricks. Uh, small approaches, uh, small uh, style preferences that uh, feels natural for Ruby. Uh, they provide uh, provide us with uh, ability to make better code uh, with uh, more testable, more robust, and so on. Uh, so uh, these days, I I think that um, one of the probably un- underestimated for um, uh, functional programming capabilities is uh, that uh, Ruby's uh, preferred style for mes- method chaining. It just uh, allows to uh, naturally structure code in the way that um, embraces functional thinking, that this thing leads to that thing, leads to that thing, not uh, we have one thing and, and then uh, uh, change, change it uh, 10 times in uh, very unholy ways. Uh, so uh, while I um, consider myself now really involved into Ruby future and Ruby development, uh, I believe that uh, adding some, some really small things to language uh not uh, not change uh, changing it to something completely different but uh moving far farther away it it already moves uh will uh, may, uh, make the functional st- style even more natural than it is today which is uh, which it is already more natural in ruby than uh, in a uh, lot of rival languages like let's not call, call the names uh, so that's that's currently the point of my interests and uh, what <laughs> what i really like to, to talk about as you probably can, can see nice so is i i know that the You've talked about some changes to Ruby that might make it easier to do functional programming. Is pattern matching one of those things that you'd you'd like to see changed? Um, or what are some of the changes you'd like to see in Ruby to, to make it easier to do functional programming? Uh, but pattern matching is uh, definitely the, uh, the thing that uh, typically associated with functional programming. And uh, it, uh, it's as it not, not, it is not, uh, uh, mandatory for functional programming style, but it definitely helps to uh, make code, code more more functional, uh, 
in in the sense I explain explained above in uh, in the sense of uh, chain, changing things uh, from this pattern we, we change this way from that pattern we change this way uh, it uh, uh, it is important though to um, not to reinvent things because Ruby has has some some kind of pattern matching with uh, case operator. Uh, so it's uh, important to to move far, further the, the line we already have, not not like uh, drop it. Another thing that um, uh, I, I actually should slow down real fast. Um, I forgot to <laughs> I didn't explain myself very well. So just so people, if they don't know what we're talking about. Um, a pattern matching is that if you called a function or a method that it would recognize the um, parameters you sent and it it would call um, a function based on, oh, it's it's got a match. So you were saying we can use the case statement and things. There's other ways to do it. It's not necessarily required to do it. It just makes it easier. But just so that people understand what, what we mean when we say pattern matching, we're saying that a lambda or a function or something, a block could could recognize the parameters coming in and then um, conditionally run if if it matches. Is that is that fair to to, to simplify it that way? Uh, well, uh, in my head, the pattern matching is uh, a bit wider than that. It's not not necessarily uh, like sele selecting of uh, function by by its definition with pattern. Because if if we look, for example, uh, at Rust language it has much statement and it uh, it doesn't use it to to define new methods uh, it's just like our case but uh, much more po po powerful because it can uh, also uh, omit some uh, some uh, parts of pattern uh, bind some t some uh, parts of a pattern to local variables and so on and uh, it's uh, totally easy to imagine uh, how ruby's case uh, just grow, uh, grows uh, grows to um, this direction uh, like binding local variables when when case matching and uh, uh, naturally without like new syntax for method definitions uh, uh, naturally it, uh, it allows to um, I'd say alternative uh, ways of polymorphisms, and uh, we use it too with uh, uh, inheritance and and uh, this kind of things. Uh, another thing that I'm uh, currently, I'd say, fighting about uh, in uh, Ruby Core Tracker is that you know this yield self method that introduced in Ruby 2.5. Uh, uh, we really wanted to have it re renamed, and we have it renamed in Ruby 2.6. It would be called just Zen. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, despite how simple the idea is, it would uh, it can change the uh, ways we code, the ways we see code to to more more idiomatic. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, it's uh, more more interesting that um, it's not like you could, you can just uh, get some. Uh, Okay, Haskell has this feature, and like I don't know, Elixir has this feature, and we just copy paste them, and they would work. Like with this yell, uh, yell self uh, method, uh, a lot of people were angry when it was introduced because they wanted to see it like Elixir pipe, like an operator. And uh, there were a lot of explanations that uh, no, in Ruby we chain everything with methods, so and blocks, so we should have methods which change chains blocks and there are still a lot of discussions uh this this the same way it is for a lot of other things the same pattern matching that we already discussed that uh, we uh, will better change our case statements and uh, have new method definitions or um, the same the same with um, for example uh with uh, uh, mutability or immutability. It's not like uh, okay, let's uh, let, let's make all, all our objects immutable, but uh, let's make uh, immutable objects more natural. The same is um, with uh, uh, calling calling methods by names, uh, which is uh, really powerful, uh, uh, a small small scale fun functional te technique, and uh, it's a bit uh, a bit worse in Ruby. It's uh, hard to um, bind uh, arguments in declarative way and so on. 
And uh, the large part of this work is speed. Because, uh, uh, like, you know, they say when uh, Bjarne Strauss would design the C++, uh, it was... Uh, at some places very rare design, but uh, their mantra was zero cost abstractions. They added like cool features to C, but it costed uh, absolutely nothing. It compiled down to C. In uh, now the Rust language borrows the same mantra, zero cost abstractions. You, you have really high level concepts, but they cost zero. In Ruby, it's unfortunately not this way. But uh, the trick is uh, the more functional we became, the more room of, of, uh, for optimization we have. Because if uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, ran random blocks uh, with uh, a lot of code inside them, it's hard to optimize. If we know that this block is produced from that symbol and this block is just that method uh, bind with, zo with those arguments, it becomes easier to uh, in inside the uh, interpreter to, to analyze, optimize, and... Uh, somehow shift towards uh, less costly abstractions, let, let's say this. So pro probably that's the, the directions of functionality in Ruby. Nice. So, so besides speeding it up and, and making it easier to write, well, okay, I, I'm a little bit summarizing what you said, but um, and, and, and mixing in a little bit of what I've experienced with functional programming, but being able to run things a little bit faster and write a little bit at a higher level, being able to uh, um, uh, build a build up towards a simpler interface. Um, good, two good reasons. But it's, it, it seems like with Ruby, if, if Ruby still is Ruby, you know, we're not going to try to, like you said, try to bring in Haskell or Elixir or things that don't fit well. It seems like it would have a, a more or less uh, gentle um, introduction. So say I had a, a, a project that I already liked in Ruby and I could just adjust it a little bit here and there and make it faster or easier to run. Is that kind of how you see it? That it would be a, a gentle um, gentle extension to what we have? That we just, just take what we have and, and, and make it a little easier to be functional? Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking about. Uh, you see, a lot of the work uh, on in this direction is uh, done on many levels. Because uh, if uh, you saw, uh, for example, uh, Luca Guigi's uh, last work on Hanami and uh, uh, Nick Satter's last work on Tri Trailblazer, it's uh, um, in... Uh, in a lot of cases, it's the same things like uh, um, purity, immu immutability, chain of calls, just on a high level for a web frameworks uh, with uh, some new frameworks that uh, uh, that things more functional. The same, uh, I am talking about the same, but on a low level, on level of... Uh, I don't know, single line of code or single chain, chain of calls. And I see it as... Uh, mm, it's a very, very gradual process. It's just like, uh, you know, in um, 17th year, it was fashionable to write it this way, but now we have that and that methods, and typically we all write it this way. We, have, we even have, uh, I don't know, Rubocop Cop to uh, suggest that we uh, rewrite this, um, this chain that way and it would be a bit faster and a bit more readable. No, uh, nothing like, okay, let's throw away everything we have and everything we write. Just, just a slow, slow, slow progress in the way that uh, currently ten, uh, tends to be seen as um, easier to write, easier to test and probably faster. I like that. I, I tend to appreciate when when something when I notice something could be easier and I don't have to change everything right now, but oh it could be a little easier, a little faster. Oh, okay, this is getting better. And um because you know, we all have if we have Ruby projects, they're probably important to keep them all running. But if we can gently you know, migrate to something a little bit easier to run, a little bit faster, I like that. Uh, at least that's the, the way I tend to think you know, get there gradually and slowly instead of rebuild everything fast. Yeah, I, I, uh, it um, can be added that uh, in new versions of Ruby, uh, currently uh, 
maintainers are um, really careful about adding some fatal incom incompati incompatibilities, you know, with, uh, for example, this Yelp self uh, method that I can talk for, uh, for hours about how it, awesome it is. Uh, it, uh, it is easily can be backported and it, it is backported with backports game. Uh, so we, we have some incompatible syntaxes, but uh, most of uh, new, cool, and even very functional things, they can be backported. So when uh, Ruby 2.6 is out, you can just install backports of polyfill gem and uh, say to colleagues, okay, let's try this small method and that small method. And we'll see, my, maybe in two places in code. And uh, if uh, either they believe you or you don't, I am happy my colleagues believe me that Yelp self is cool and we now use it a lot even on Ruby 2.4. But it's, uh, it's everything uh, to not break things uh, in and not alienate people uh, saying, okay, it's our language now. We, we are cool functionalists, go away. Yeah, I was looking at your, your blog articles about Yield Self, and it looks kind of, it's not the pipe operator, but it kind of works like that, right? You have a, a thing, and then you Yield Self, and then you call another function on it. And so you can kind of chain um functions and just line them up in a in a way that makes makes a little bit more sense to to see the whole the whole idea of what you're doing yes yeah, that's, that's exactly the pipe operator done done the ruby way that's the, that's the thing it's it it was just very unfortunate to name it so not not everybody appreciated it <laughs> you know i I've, I've learned elixir in in the last couple of years and uh and I thought, you know, and I hadn't been as active with Ruby. I thought, man, I really wish we had the pipe operators. Like, well, we do. <laughs> it's one of these gentle introductions. Like, oh, there's a better way in Ruby. I can use yield self, you know, and and um, or whatever it's it's named. I like this then um, uh, proposal you're making. If we called it then instead of yield self, that that makes a little bit more sense. You know, um, here's a the thing. Then do this. Then do that, and just chain together functions on a on an object yeah as far as i aware it the proposal is already accepted by mats so it uh, probably will already be then in ruby 2.6 wow i feel like i'm looking into the future <laughs> so what's what's the process of adding these features into the language um I, you know you're talking about some of these discussions that happen um, i know that the core uh, dev meeting happens, but yeah. So how does, how do these get proposed and then how do they work their way into the actual language? Uh, well, the process is uh, pretty simple. I'm, uh, I, I, I should uh, say that I am uh, not, not affiliated with core maintainers. I am just, uh, you know, a concerned citizen. Uh, the, the process is uh, pretty simple even for concerned citizens because uh, everybody can uh, have an account on bugsrubylang.org and uh, uh, propose whatever, whatever they like. Uh, Sometimes it gets noticed. Sometimes it, it does not at all. Uh, sometimes there are discussions like uh, for five or six years because uh, I, I believe that before uh, me and uh, several other people pushed hard for, for Yield Self, it was uh, proposed, it was accepted that it's a really good idea, but we can't uh, have a good name for it. And uh, it was discussed for five years in uh, Ruby official tracker. Uh, till, uh, till the date that somebody said, okay, let's accept it in, uh, with any name that, uh, that Mats, Mats wants. We just want to have this method. And it was accepted as Yelp self. And then we were unhappy. And uh, the rest is already history. Uh, a lot of things uh, being proposed in a decent manner uh, by complete stranger. Like, uh, let's add this method, it would work this way, here is reference implementations, or even better, here is the patch, they, they just accept it. A lot of other things, uh, things they tended to be ign uh, ignored till the last time when uh, the maintainers decided to be more, more open and um, they have 
like monthly meeting of uh, very core maintainers uh, discussing all all uh, kind of stuff about Ruby, and uh, that's sometimes the um, place where they look at, at the new proposals or ignore them. And uh, uh, till uh, till the till this year, it was just they decided themselves what they would look at, or but now they want to be more open, and now it's uh, just a regular. Uh, also ticket in this bugs dot uh, and uh, everybody can can write oh, okay please on on the next meeting uh, please look at this please look at that it doesn't mean they would would have time to look at it it doesn't mean uh, of course that it would be approved anonymously but it uh, uh, really really high the probability that uh, the progress uh, would would move on because uh, you know different di different ruby communities have different needs and uh, i sometimes uh, sometime uh, felt like uh, uh, the maintainers community they they are not always in uh, line with uh, what a lot of other uh, groups want and now for these groups it's just easier to be here when you start a new project typically you need things like a domain name hosting things like that when I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks and VPNs. Plus they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code RubyRogues2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is RubyRogues2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. So I'm really interested in how one would refactor object-oriented code in, in a more functional way. So say you were going into a code base that was built with the object-oriented object paradigm in mind, what would you look for in order to um, kind of refactor in a functional way? Uh, well, I'll probably say the heresy now, but uh, object-oriented and functional, uh, they are not antonyms, in fact. In my head, uh, object-orientedness is a way of uh, structuring data, while uh, functional is a way of structuring flow. Antonym to functional is procedural. Antonym to object-oriented, it can be like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> without objects. So, uh, when I am uh, refactoring um, very old uh, object-oriented code that I don't like and so on and so on, I will not typically look at uh, uh, two object-oriented patterns to make them functional. I would look uh, for procedural patterns. I would look uh, for data that, uh, that is being uh, mutated instead of producing new data. I would look at... Um, uh, cases when the large class does everything inside itself instead of uh, just accepting accepting something uh, and having a method to produce something and and never change in its lifetime. Uh, in fact, um, I I believe that there there is a lot of misconception uh, about the thing that uh, either you're functional or you're object oriented. I believe that a Ruby's thing. Uh, why it's really cool is that um, this uh, like uh, co what I call co core of Ruby's functional abilities, this method chaining, that's, uh, it uh, really works cool with uh, uh, methods which belongs to objects. So with clearly designed objects, uh, a lot of small and immutable objects with clear uh, responsibilities producing other objects, which is uh, just uh, that uh, data plus behavior uh, and flow organized in functional way, it would be ideal for me. 
Yeah, I think people uh, can come into Ruby thinking that it is so object oriented, but there really are so many paradigms that that are functional in Ruby already. There's a lot that you can do. One thing that I, I wanted to talk about just for a minute is that we talk about sort of the object oriented uh, versus, say, the the functional. And th- there's a lot of movement these days in the space of functional programming. A lot of people are excited about it. A lot of good reasons for it, too. But um, sometimes I see people sort of reach for the tool because it's cool instead of because it's the right thing to use. So how, how do you advise people as far as whether or not they should actually use functional programming as the thing they reach for first versus, um, you know, just doing things sort of the way that we've always done in Ruby with some of the more object oriented approaches, or how do you decide which one to use when? Uh, okay. So that's, that's really good question uh, because uh, the answer is simple and the answer is complicated. The simple answer always go functional you'll be good. But uh, (laughs) the complicated part of the answer, uh, the people uh, tend to mix uh, functional style and functional tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, Functional style, as I said, like uh, if uh, if you try always to write with like small immutable objects uh, chained in chains of methods, uh, producing new objects and... um, Nothing, nothing mutates and ch- and flow is visible. You always be good. It's it's ideal. But uh, the bad things happen when uh, uh, people try to grow new tools, um, just like they they use it to have them, or just like they use it to study in them in university, uh, in in environments that are not ready for them. For example, there are a lot of. Uh, uh, really, really a lot, like uh, tens uh, or, or or even more gems, uh, which uh, try to bring monads in Ruby. Uh, without, uh, mm, I don't know, try, trying to befriend the Ruby's concepts and what exactly monad is, it's just, uh, yeah, Ru- Ruby is uh, really DSL-friendly, so you can just sit one evening and have your AZ class, your result class, your... Um, I, I don't remember others, sorry. <laughs> I am not very good at uh, monads. Uh, and uh, you, you, you can have these monads and you can say that, okay, let's organize everything with monads now. I have a gem with monads. Uh, and uh, this way you like alienate uh, most, of, uh, most of people and most of approaches from your mind. Uh, you see monads everywhere, which is not a bad thing. But um, what what I tend what I tend to see is um, uh, the the concept b- behind monads. For example, uh, uh, maybe monad, uh, which uh, which is a thing that uh, um, uh, like encapsulates uh, the the could be result or no result. But uh, either way, we can uh, we can work with this thing. Uh, homogeneously and uh, it's like pretty convenient uh, you don't need maybe monad in ruby because we now have this uh, ampersand dot operator which which is exactly maybe monad done the ruby way is there a result uh, or there is no result but you 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 can do exactly the same thing with it and uh, it relates to many 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 concepts that are just uh, taken from there and put to here uh, and they call it the same names that uh, uh, hardcore functional programmers uh, tend tend to call them. And uh, people say, okay, but I probably don't want functional programming here. While fun- functional programming as an idea, it's, it's pretty simple and it's pretty useful. Something like that. It, it kind of reminds me, I, I do this all the time with my life. I see something I like and I, oh, I want that, just that. And then um, with a little bit of time, I, I realize, no, actually what I want is its consequence. And then I get a, a little more you know, robust, a little more mature idea of, oh, this is a better way to do it, say in Ruby, or a better way to do it with this project. You know, it's, um, I, I can see that the benefit of, of organizing my code in a, in a simpler way or, or, or being able to uh, interact functionally with things um, is great. And then 
but it takes me a little bit of time to see a, a mature way to implement it. <laughs> so instead of just naively, oh yeah, I, I, you know, let's bring in the monads to 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 Ruby. Like, no, let's create the monad functionality and output. Let's 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 get the benefit of a monad and not just try to to do it a different way. I like that. I, and uh, in 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 Ruby, it's in fact pretty pretty tempting to imitate functionality from other languages. I I remember doing it like uh, all my programming life. Like, oh, the school uh, thing from Python, or the school thing from Elixir, or the school thing that I remember from my school years with C plus plus. I just I just can imitate it with DSL, but do I need to? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one other thing that I've run into a bit is uh, people get excited about, like you said, some of the functional style things. So you get stuff like, uh, you know, they want to do immutability. And what winds up happening is, is they get some kind of halfway immutable thing or some mostly, you know, whatever it is that they were looking for a uh, way of implementing it because Ruby just doesn't, you know, I mean, you can freeze objects, but it's just not quite the same thing. So how, how do you get people around that? Well, this uh, this uh, indeed not easy because uh, yeah we have freeze, but it's um, uh, how to say less less than optimal because for large object like uh, freezing like ten variables and constructor uh, and then uh, don't forget to freeze all all of those components over uh, all, all of their components if this complicated variables and so on and so on so. Um, in fact, the, be the best uh, probably you can get to, to it is uh, just uh, think about immutable objects not as a construct, because we don't have this construct in Ruby uh, besides freezing, but as a discipline. Like uh, okay. a small mut mutability probably would not hurt in some, some cases, but if if you typically ten, tend uh, to not change objects in place and uh, typically you don't try to um, create objects that uh, create classes that are sort as be going through a lot of in place changes but sometimes some sometimes uh, having a um, mutability at hand is, is uh, nothing bad because for example i don't know if you write a parser then string scanner which is uh, um, by uh, by default and by design, it's mutable. It, it just uh, spits new new parts of uh, text uh, text you uh, you try to parse. Ha having no mutable objects, uh, you will go with, with with hacks around it. Yeah, it's uh, those cases are in numerals, in fact, and with uh, some some disciplines, some uh, approaches that um, embrace producing new objects instead of changing the old ones, um, you you can uh, can get cl closer to immutability, but never too close. It's uh, uh, at some point it it will become a pe pe performance problem because in. Uh, I don't know, in our work in, for scientific Ruby, if you have a data frame with uh, hundreds of thousands of rows and you want to change some row, well, some copy on right tricks and so on and so on, but you can just, just change it and change this row if you need some scientific calculation. And you probably would not be killed at least, at least immediately. Maybe a good practice of that discipline is think twice before you bang a method. <laughs> oh, do I really want to change this in place? I like that. <laughs> I, I like too that. I mean, you know, the conventions and, and the way we treat each other tends to be, uh, I think, a little bit wiser way of doing things like immutability. You know, like if I'm going to think twice before I bang a method, you know, if, if I'm going to have to excuse myself of why I made that change, you know, because because we do it different here, um, then, you know, oh, I'm thinking and I'm talking and I'm figuring it out, but I'm doing it with people. I'm solving problems. And sometimes having a hard, fast rule, you know, that's that's fine. But I, I like the human, the humane approach <laughs> to coding. That yeah, I, I banged this function. I, I, I did. That. I, I used the bang version. I made the mutable change. And and guess what? I feel like it's appropriate here. If you you'll notice it because it's not what we normally do, and we can have a conversation if you disagree. I I like humans coming together to solve problems. 
It's never just black and white, bang or don't bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if if we are talking about uh, object-oriented plus functional, uh, then uh, some some notion of mutability is always with you because uh, even if your like cool class don't have uh, don't behaves with its public interface like uh, something mutable. It's just uh, constructs itself and sp- and spits data. It still can uh, I don't know calculate some some internal things uh, uh, which are pre- pretty intense and calculate and calculate them only when they needed. And from like uh, purist uh, functional point of view, it it already will be a guilt because uh, that's probably the thing why why they typically don't don't have cl- classes and objects at all, just poor structs. So it's it's a compromise. It's a compromise. Well, I also like that, you know, I mean, we have all these things so that humans can solve problems. You know, programmers can be happy. Um, I can find myself in a situation. It's not even necessarily for me always finding the best way to write the code. Sometimes it's just finding a way that this brain of mine can write the code. You know, we all come to a problem with experience um, that might be limited or different and and finding a way to get it done in Ruby and then eventually getting it done more in a Ruby way is, that's a very happy path for me as well. You know, do it now, do it this way. And then, oh, okay, there might be another way. I'll discover it later. <laughs> Well, it sounds like we're kind of winding down. Anything else that we want to jump on here? I was wondering um, if, if we could. It kind of, it's it's similar to what we've been talking about. But if, if you don't mind, if we uh, talk about processing large JSON hashes, um, you know, something I, I think you've had experience with, and I'd, I'd love to see your take on how how you would break down that problem. Uh. Well, <laughs> it really depends because uh, you know, uh, all in all, I am I am not uh, some some university geek. I am just just uh, your regular startup uh, senior developer. So I I take a lot of compromises and uh, uh, I always struggle to write code that uh, I'd like um, to write. But uh, uh, I believe that. Uh, if if we are talking in very very general, when we have uh, some large JSON, JSON hash and we want to have some uh, some data in, uh, extracted from it, uh, then uh, probably our way, both uh, Ruby idiomatic and functional and and so on and so on, uh, is to use my gem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> blah 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 and so on uh but uh, uh in uh, yeah yeah uh i i have a gem for this really uh the idea um, uh, that came to me um, this way that uh, uh we have uh, a lot of um, uh uh, a lot of uh, useful methods in our hashes in Ruby, and it's uh, some some say it's good, some some say that our core objects are already bloated. But uh, typically, it's uh, hard to work with uh, deep hashes uh, like JSON uh, hashes with uh, a lot of data, which uh, returned by modern REST API or GraphQL, uh, GraphQL API. Uh, so uh, my uh, my thought was: Can we uh, continue the same way that we work with simple hashes, r- uh, idiomatic, clean, chainable? Uh, can we do the same with the nested hashes? So uh, there are several several approaches to do, to this. Uh, one, uh, for example, is Transport's gem made by uh, Peter Solnitz. I I think you all know him. Uh, the, this uh, guy behind Virtus Rom and uh, uh, Patty Alif, uh, behind behind Dryer Bay, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, the, there are a lot of similar gems. But uh, now I'll be a bit bad. 
I believe that uh, sometimes it's it's that case that I talked uh, talked before the, that when um, guys try to uh, to be really functional, uh, really clean in this way, immutability, functionality, and so on, they tend tend to drift too far apart from uh, idiomatic Ruby. This code works. It is short. It is effective, uh, but. It is a bit hard to read for those who are not familiar with the libraries. So, yeah, I made a gem that uh, tries to be both uh, idiomatic and powerful in, pro in processing nested, ha nested hashes. Uh, the way it, uh, it works or is, in, or is in, in, intended to work because it's in very early stages, it just takes the hash and... Uh, uh, encapsulates it in objects uh, that you can uh, chain a lot of methods like uh, your regular hash, like transform case, transform values, merge, and so on, and so on, and so on. But uh, able to process uh, nested keys, like, for example, dig does in uh, modern Ruby, but also with uh, wildcards, so you can, uh, in, uh, in one statement, say that uh, all uh, data that uh, that lies inside this k and all items of array inside this k and all k's inside that k uh, should be transformed this way. Uh, it's pretty experimental. It's um, still a bit slower than than I'd like it to, but uh, I really uh, really like how it looks and. Uh, um, Considering number of stars on GitHub, I am not not the only one who likes it. Uh, so yeah, it's um, uh, like I'm I'm really sorry to to advertise myself and my own work, but it uh, really really demonstrates uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, how how we can try uh, to uh, like befriend fun functional style and uh, Ruby idiomaticity, something like that. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. It is a good demonstration. So the gem's called Hmm H M. It's awesome, and, and and it's it's a good demonstration of things we've been talking about today. Of this is the way you know that we could break down a problem if it's complex or nested. And so it's an example, and and I like that. Thank you. So there you. Well, and I like the concern over. Hey, this is Ruby. This is how Ruby developers read code. And so I don't want to deviate too far from that so that it's approachable for Ruby developers. And I think that's important, even if you have some sort of ideological or other understanding that it may be better in a different way. Or, yeah. or measurably better in a different way, you know, oh, on another scale. Uh, hmm. Uh, yeah, it's uh, really important. Uh, the thing is I am mentoring students uh, a lot and mentoring, uh, in, including courses like Basic Ruby. It's like I'm taking people who didn't know a bit about programming and uh, going with them for two months uh, through, through all the Ruby, object-oriented functional metaprogramming, DSLs, uh, and, and so on and so on. And I believe that uh, since I started do doing that, I see a lot of Ruby's features a lot of uh, Ruby's libraries in a different light because uh, sometimes, sometimes when you like, uh, uh, I grew with this library. I saw a SQL uh, library when it was zero point zero point one, and uh, you are used to it. You you just know that uh, in in our land things work this, this way. And when you try to explain to new people how it works, it's really enlightening. So uh, I um, probably since I started to work uh, a lot with students, I became less uh, radical in my code style and my language proposals because I always think, but you know, I always think uh, both ways, uh, how it can uh, make language better and cleaner, how it can be easy to explain it, but without losing the uh, power. Teaching others is the best way to make sure you know why you are doing what you're doing. <laughs> and I think that's great. You make sure you're not doing you know, things in a functional way just because it's the hot new thing, but there's a reason why. I like that. And then having that level of, of, of maturity with the idea, to me, that calms me down too. Like <laughs> I, can, I can let go of some of the tension in my head 
once I kind of know, oh, I'm doing this for a good reason. I taught mm-hmm. somebody. I, I kind of finished. I finished something in my head. Now I can relax a little bit. Which, um, I'm always looking for a way to relax a little bit. <laughs> cool. Well, should we do some picks? For you, the listeners of Ruby Rogues, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Uh, David, do you want to start us off with picks? Sure. I've been uh, I've been thinking a lot lately and writing about um, mental health for software developers and just how do we maintain a good, good, healthy mental situation. And a book I've picked up probably a dozen times and kept telling myself, "Oh, I'll never read it." And no, I'm reading it now. It's called Flow, <laughs> and Flow is about finding a. a an optimal experience. It's it's creating um, happiness or creating um, uh, a good flow with life. And and it turns out that um, the kinds of work we do as software developers um, tends to be this dedicated, purpose driven life. Um, so learning how to maintain that inner state of happiness and being good with with the hard work that we do is is important as software developers. So my pick today is flow. Awesome. Eric, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I've, I've just got one pick. I apologize for not being super involved in, in this podcast. I've got a little bit of a fire that I'm putting out. Um, the pick that I have is an old gem that's really not usable anymore. Uh, it's a, a gem by my friend Nate Hopkins called Ellington. And this was written back five, it started five years ago as an idea. Uh, basically, it it treated code processes and flows as almost a, a train station uh, with different uh, types of actors in it, whether it's a conductor, a passenger, a route. And essentially, it passes very similar to um, many uh, modern um, functional languages where it says, okay, here's an object, pass it down, mutate it, pass it down, mutate it, pass it down, mutate it. So... That's my pick for today. It's 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 a fascinating read, a code read if you're interested, and he documents it extremely well. So that's that's all I got. Awesome. Catherine, do you have some picks for us? Yeah. So one is a keynote from RubyCon from 2016 um, that is all about functional programming in Ruby. So if you are listening to this podcast and you're like, oh my God, I don't even know what to, where to begin. What does functional even mean? How do we use it in Ruby? I think this is a wonderful uh, talk. It is by Cassandra Cruz um, and she delivers it in a really wonderful way. It's in a simple way, in a fun way. Um, so it's called Ruby versus the Titans of FP. And that's by Cassandra Cruz from RubyConf 2016. And my other pick is a book uh, that I'm just starting to read. Um, so hopefully I don't finish it and then regret this having been my pick. Uh, but it's called Radical Candor. And it is by Kim Scott. And I think having a culture of feedback in your place of work, well, actually in your life in general is really important. And this is a a great book on how to do that correctly and how to, their their tagline is care personally and challenge directly. Uh, So I think that's good for everyone to read as well. Nice. Dave, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I'm probably not going to pronounce it right, but uh, 
my pick is a Gila tent. It's a window tent that you can apply on your home windows or whatever. And I recently did it in my garage and in Georgia, it's already like super hot here, you know, eighties and nineties. So I added this tent to our garage windows and it's literally cooled the garage by 10 degrees. So uh, that's a huge pick for me. Nice. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a pick as well. I'm going to pick a book. Um, I just barely, actually, I think I have like 10 minutes left on Audible on it, um, but it's called Crucial Accountability. And it basically walks you through talking to people when they don't deliver on things that they committed to do. And this is, hasn't really been an issue that I've run into, but it does make me think about, okay, what are the things that are not going the way that I want them to? And then how do I talk about them? So, you know, I don't have massive issues with my wife or anything, but you know, there were a couple of things where I was like, oh, maybe I should. Sorry, I'm pair pro- podcasting with my two year old in my lap. Um, you know, maybe I should, uh, you know, talk about some of the things that I'd like to, you know, make a little bit better uh, in this way. And, it, you know, it talks about, you know, creating safety in the conversation and, you know, all of these different things and, and recognizing what outcome you want and things like that. So, anyway, um, it, it was a terrific book and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, let me see if I can pull up the author's name real quick for you. And then, um, we'll have Victor give us some picks. Um, the author is loading author is, um, oh, there are a whole bunch of them. Joseph Grenny, uh, David Maxfield and Carrie Patterson. So anyway, go check that out. They have, I have another one called crucial conversations. I haven't read or listened to yet. Um, but anyway, it was a terrific book and I really enjoyed it. So um victor do you have some picks for us yep i'll uh, use it as an excuse to uh talk talk a bit more about my own work sorry uh the one 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 thing that i really wanted people to look at uh like half a year ago i thought about ruby that um it lacks uh uh, decent uh, reference uh, that is uh, that would be easily achieve- achievable for novice uh, with uh, you know all all the stuff about the language compiled in in some one place. So I did some uh, writing plus compilation of fi- the official docs plus comp- uh, plus compilation of Ruby site plus. Uh, Dog book design and so on. So I I made uh, uh, open source Ruby reference that uh, could be easily updated with, and I plan to update it with uh, each new version of language. And uh, I believe that uh, it could be could be useful for for a lot of people that uh, that it's uh, uh, no uh, that they know where to look. Uh, I'll I'll post the link. And uh, another one is my uh, pet project of uh, now three years. I even had a Ruby Association grant to per, uh, to perform it. Uh, it's called Reality. Uh, it's uh, open source analog to Wolfram Alpha, like uh, a project that try, uh, tries to pick uh, all the things uh, from the uh, open data sources like uh, Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap and uh, make, make them uh, available as a Ruby object uh, to experiment in some idiomatic ways. So a lot of my uh, recent findings about how I do, I do want to write code uh, and what we miss in language and so on, it's produced by a lot of uh, work on, on this and related projects. So that would be it. Awesome. And if people want to uh, follow you online or things like that, uh, do you, what, what's your Twitter handle, GitHub handle? And if you have a blog, a blog URL. Uh, I am Zverok everywhere, absolutely everywhere since uh, my 15. It's, uh, it is a word that uh, means small, small beast in Russian. Uh, I, it's too hard to explain why, why is it so, but I am Zverok absolutely everywhere. Twitter, GitHub, Zverok, GitHub, or is my personal blog, and so on and so on, so you can find me. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this show up, and we will catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.